Hi there, my name is Neil Sinababu. I teach at the National University of Singapore, and I'm here to comment on a paper for the on Online Undergraduate Ethics Conference. Uh, the paper is titled uh, Humean Reason and Desire, Reconciling Moral Cognitivism and Motivational Externalism, and the author is Kitri Gano. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kitri for writing and sending me an excellent paper. Uh, David Kaloran of the Jackson Center for Human Values and Coastal Carolina University uh, for setting up this conference. Okay, so uh, let me start by laying out a certain kind of puzzle into which Keatree's paper fits. Uh, this puzzle concerns the nature of moral judgment and uh, the nature of motivation that arises from moral judgment. Um, and there are three propositions that are parts of the puzzle. Uh, the thing that makes the puzzle a puzzle is that uh, most philosophers find each one at least somewhat attractive. Uh, but if you accept all three, you end up with this disastrous consequence that it's impossible to make moral judgments. Here's what the three parts of the puzzle are. First, cognitivism, the view that moral judgments are beliefs. People like that because it seems like moral judgments can be true or false in the way beliefs can, and that they can fit into logical arguments the way that beliefs can. So cognitivism uh, is a nice-looking view of moral judgment. The second is internalism, about the connection between moral judgment and motivation. Uh, according to internalism, if you make a moral judgment, it will give you some motivation to act in accordance with the judgment. Uh, if you judge something to be wrong, you'll be motivated to uh, not do it. And if you judge something to be, to be right, you'll be motivated to do it. Now here's the third thing, the Humean theory of motivation, so named because uh, it was promoted and defended by the great philosopher David Hume. According to the Humean theory, desire is necessary for motivation, so that beliefs alone can't motivate. Put all three of them together, and here's what you get. According to cognitivism and internalism, moral judgments are beliefs that motivate. But according to the Humean theory of motivation, there can't be any such thing. Beliefs alone can't motivate. You need desires. So that's what the puzzle is. Uh, and this is the puzzle uh, into which uh, Kitri uh, uh, steps with her paper, and I think she solves the puzzle in the right way. Uh, retain cognitivism, the view that moral judgments are beliefs. Reject internalism, uh, the view that moral judgments uh, have their intrinsic motivational force. Instead, accept the externalist view, on which the motivational force that drives moral judgment comes from outside the judgment it's itself, and retain the third thing, the Humean theory of motivation, according to which you need a desire to be motivated, and beliefs alone can't motivate action. Now, this is a solution to the puzzle that has uh, become fairly popular, uh, especially in the United States, uh, over the last 40 years or so. Uh, and I am happy to welcome Kitri to the cognitivist, externalist, Humean team. Uh, and uh, at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll say a little bit about other exciting arguments, much like Kitri's, that have been offered. Uh, but first, let me just say a couple of uh, minor things about uh, historical notes within the paper that I just wanted to bring up and say something uh, minor about. Uh, because a lot of the paper does sort of address these issues by looking at historical figures who have uh, uh, taken positions uh, relating to these kinds of issues. So uh, one uh, part of the paper uh, deals with ancient philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, and one of the things I was just wondering about is the discussion of how Socrates gets Meno to deny that it is possible to know something is evil, uh, yet desire it nonetheless because uh, uh, what the text says is, there is no one who desires to be miserable. Uh, okay, that might be true, but, uh, you know, being miserable isn't the sort of moral thing we are talking about uh, when we're interested in internalism about uh, moral motivation, right? Um, it sort of makes me wonder, as I sometimes do when reading ancient philosophy, uh, how often the ancients, or whether they were, uh, addressing moral notions that are the moral notions we recognize, goodness and rightness as we recognize them, or if they were talking about something more egoistic, more self-interested, uh, or in some cases when they're not talking about egoistic, self-interested things, if it's still a further evaluative kind of notion that doesn't really match up with our conception of morality. Uh, I'm not an ancient philosopher, I don't really know what to say about that, but it's something I've just generally been curious about and it came up a bit in the paper. 
Um, uh, but I should stop talking about it because someone else would probably be better to talk to about that than me. Um, I do a little bit, uh, well, I don't do any work on the ancients, but I do some uh, uh, work on Hume, and I like Hume very much. Uh, and I wanted to uh, talk about some of the stuff uh, in the argument about the uh, motivational force of moral judgments from Hume that Keatry talks about. Um, uh, she very carefully lays out ways that Hume's argument can go uh, and uh, deals with various ways to make it go better. Uh, one of the central issues in the discussion is uh, what Hume means by talking about how uh, uh, talking about something he calls morals. I looked through, you know, sort of full text searching all the uses of the term morals in the treatise to try to figure out what it was, and I couldn't get a clear view of whether morals here are uh, uh, moral rules, principles, things of that nature, or whether they are moral sentiments or passions, sort of mental states we have in us that motivate us. Uh, the thing I'd always done that sort of, I think, makes Hume's argument go a little bit better is understand morals to be the sentiments or the passions themselves. So uh, when uh, Hume says things like morals uh, uh, excite passions and influence actions, well, I think what he's saying is moral judgments are sorts of things in our heads that have a certain kind of motivational role. Uh, that's what the morals are. Um, I guess if you say of someone that they have no morals, uh, you're saying of them that they don't have the appropriate uh, motivational uh, mental states that will drive them to not do the bad thing or to do the good thing. All right. Uh, so that's just a little bit of stuff about uh, uh, the um, uh, historical philosophers discussed in Keatry's paper. Um, now let me uh, move to uh, an example uh, from Keatry's paper that I really liked that's sort of at the core of the positive view she lays out. It comes at the end. Um, and it's addressing the issue of whether morality has prescriptive force. Uh, when we talk about morality being intrinsically motivational, um, uh, some internalists want to equate the prescriptive force of morality with its being motivational. Um, and Keatry wants to separate these two issues, I think, rightly. And the really nice kind of uh, uh, example she gives is uh, this one where uh, the doctor gives you a prescription. Let me just sort of build up the example in sort of a direction that I think will make its force clear. Um, suppose I went to the doctor's office just because my mom wanted me to, and I do not care about following what the doctor says. I don't care about getting better. I just went there because mom told me to, and now I'm there. And the doctor gives me a prescription. So I have this prescription. And, you know, I never uh, take it. Maybe I never even get it filled. You know, uh, uh, well, it's still a prescription, you know. It's still, there's still some sense in which I'm supposed to do it, even if I'm not motivated at all to do it, uh, to, to, to follow the prescription. It's still there, sort of hanging above me, and there's sort of a supposed to that comes out of the uh, prescription. I'm supposed to follow it, whether I care to or not. Supposed to in some, you know, according to some norm of doing what your doctor says, or, or something of that nature. Um, so... That's the way that Keatry suggests that we understand the prescriptive force of morality uh, that internalists like to talk about. There can be prescriptions, and they are fully prescriptive in the sense that morality is supposed to be, that we are not motivated to follow. Uh, I think that's uh, exactly the thing to say. And the thing I really liked about it was how it struck at the, uh, uh, you know, a, a term that's sort of at the core of the debate, prescriptivity, the prescriptivity of morality. Uh, that internalists like to talk about. Uh, they want to talk about this in terms of motivation, and Keatry looks at the actual case of people giving prescriptions, literal prescriptions, and see that, sees that they don't come along with that sort of motivation. Um, so I want to uh, uh, sort of introduce Keatry to uh, an awesome philosopher who was one of the early proponents of the kind of view uh, that uh, she supports. This is Philippa Foote in a wonderful old paper called Morality as a System of Hypothetical Imperatives. Uh, Foote's example there is not one of prescriptions, but an example of etiquette. Um, and uh, she uh, uh, discusses this uh, norm of etiquette that I guess may be uh, sliding into disuse these days, where if somebody sends you an invitation in the uh, third person, you're supposed to reply in the third person. So suppose uh, 
you know, they say, uh, 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 Mr. and Mrs. Smith invite Neil Sinababu to attend their wedding. You know, I'm supposed to write back according to the norms of etiquette. Neil Sinababu is honored to accept Mr. and Mrs. Smith's kind invitation to the wedding. But, you know, suppose I want to violate the norms of etiquette because I'm just kind of punk rock that way or something like that, you know? Uh, I have no motivation to follow the norms of etiquette. And I write back, y'all bring out the booze because I'm coming to your party, motherfuckers! Okay, that might be funny. It might be what I have most reason to do because really there's some reason to violate the norms of etiquette. It might be something that I'm wholeheartedly motivated to do. Um, you know, uh, uh, I may have no motivation to follow the norms of etiquette at all. Um, but uh, the norms of etiquette still apply to what I did. Uh, what I said, especially with uh, uh, cursing, was uh, uh, inappropriate as far as etiquette goes. Uh, I have violated the norms of etiquette, and I might be proud of that if I'm just like the you know crazy sort of guy who likes to do that sort of thing. Um, I can clearly violate norms that I am not motivated to follow, and that I don't have any reason in the sense of desire satisfaction to follow. Uh, that's, I think, Foote's old example that fits Keatry's uh, uh, new prescription example very well. Um, now, the norms of morality, uh, if norms can just be there without connecting to uh, what we have motivation to do and what we have reason to do arising from our motivational states, well, you can have norms that are independent of those things. And that supports the uh, cognitivist, externalist human position. Uh, by supporting the externalism, uh, by supporting the denial of the internalist thesis that is uh, uh, popular among philosophers. And I think uh, it's good to have uh, more philosophers uh, criticizing that thesis, and I really liked Keatry's prescription argument against it. Um, more uh, recent uh, uh, opponents of the uh, uh, cognitivist, internalist, human, uh, well, of, of sorry, more recent opponents of internalism who go for a cognitivist externalist human position include uh, David Brink in his book Morality, uh, uh, Mor or Moral Reason, sorry, Moral Realism and the Foundations of Ethics, uh, Peter Railton in a uh, paper titled Moral Realism and a lot of others, his other work, and uh, myself in other stuff that I'm doing including a book that I'm uh, writing uh, titled Desires Explanations. Uh, so, Keatry, uh, welcome to the team. Uh, we're very happy to have you. Uh, Thank you very much.